Hello, and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. And today we're joined by Rupert Dallas, who's currently running the sales operation at a business called DW Fritz. Now, Rupert has extensive experience in sales, including a stint at Coca Cola, which is going to be super interesting to discuss, but then obviously graduated, or maybe not graduated, but moved over into sales ops um, more recently. And so we're going to discuss that and discuss uh, his view of the world of sales operations. So, Rupert, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And, and let's kick things off by asking the, it's always a super interesting question, is that you have, as I mentioned, the, the experience actually selling. Why did you decide to move away from that and over to the operations side? Yeah, great question. Um, the main reason for moving from sales into sales ops is uh, one of of me trying to understand why leadership were making the decisions uh, that impact sales, specifically how the back of the house works to impact sales, so that uh, I could effectively make it better. Um, the worst thing as a salesperson is to have an an ineffective uh, operations team, uh, you know, trying to make things work for you that don't really work. And I decided that I, I had had enough and that I was going to mm. make it better. So there was a pain, there was a pain there with, uh, and we, we don't want to be negative on the show, but there was a, you were working as a salesperson with an ops team that maybe weren't as effective as you would like. And so you were like, well, I can definitely do a better job. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And which business did you first make that move? And did you make, make a move within uh, when you're working within a business or did you kind of hop over to a new business and then switch over then? Uh, I made that, that transition when I was working with Ecova and uh, we, we were being acquired by Angie at the time. And I was already making that transition over from sales into sales operations there. Uh, and then uh I had an opportunity to actually start my own sales operations organization, um, leaving Angie to do so, and and that I think was the the solidifying factor of this is this is where I needed to be. Awesome. And so, if we zoom into today, roughly how many salespeople are you responsible for, and how many people do you have in the ops team? So currently, I have uh, I'm responsible for twelve sales folks. And I have six people on my ops team. Interesting. Now that's a that's one of the highest ratio that because I, I ask everyone this question, and normally the typical ratio between rep and uh, ops person is like between one to fifteen, one to twenty. What are these people in the ops team doing? Yeah, so <clears throat> my ops team consists of everything from uh, the the technical sales engineers who actually have to look into the merits of each individual opportunity. Uh, I have, of course, a, you know, uh, a, an administrator for CRM, um, and then we have several different uh, software platforms that run in the background that need a dedicated person running them um, for campaigns, uh, marketing campaigns. Uh, things like um, you know distributing uh, updated spec sheets and things like that for the, te the technologies that we're developing, and so I have a person that focuses on that. But then you know to support the sales folks in our industry, we are very very highly technical as sales people, and we have to have the most technically sound. Uh, call it helpers, uh, along with the sale. And so my technical sales engineers know the sales operations piece, but more importantly, they know the technology that we're trying to sell. And most of their job is to aligning the, the, the power of our company, the ins and outs of our company to the salesperson to help them make the sale, to help them close the sale. Got it. Makes sense. So, there are some people in the ops team that I think other people may kind of basket in with the sales team if these are like solution engineers. But then also at the same time, there are both technical applications in your team that you need people to manage, but also the sale itself is very technical and therefore needs more, more people around. 
That is correct. That's a good summary. Okay, amazing. Now, on to the tech stack. Could you just give us a, a brief overview of the tools that you are using? Yeah, so we we have a CRM. We use Salesforce for our CRM. We have marketing automation. Um, we have uh, several different business intelligence tools. Um, we have uh, we use uh, Zoom Info as a platform for additional business intelligence and research. Um, and then we have uh, several different uh, feeder platforms that feed into our website and uh, that help us do. Um, accelerators for uh, new product releases. Got it. Makes sense. Now, over the past few months, I assume the the reps and you guys have been pushed more remote. What have been the biggest challenges there? Yeah, you, you know, that's it, it was very difficult at first, I'll tell you, because we are a highly sort of matrixed organization, right? Um, my team tends to Although they sit in the sales ops, they tend to be in the lab uh, doing research. They tend to be uh, in production, understanding the ins and outs of the tooling that we're making. And then they are, they tend to be on a plane heading towards, uh, you know, a, a, a project to see it uh, as it is when it's finished. So that's the difficult part of that was we can't all be in the same room at the same time like we're used to uh, when we want to collaborate. However, being forced to be at home and all be online at the same time has, has actually made us more efficient. Um, I don't have to wait uh, to send an email to wait, you know, three, four, five hours. I'll send a text or I'll send a link, you know, and they'll contact me right back right away. And so in that sense, the the working from home has given us efficiency, but <clears throat> it doesn't replace. Excuse me, <clears throat> it doesn't replace uh, you know being in the same office face to face. Got it. And have you made any like active changes to either the way you operate uh, culturally within the team or in, in terms of technology to to enable the remote work? Yeah, actually, we we started using a, a program called uh, Miro. Um, just recently, and it has been another godsend. Uh, Miro allows us to collaborate live on a project where only one person needs to be on site. Uh, so we can take a picture, take a video, we can all edit, we can write on the chalkboard, um, we can post sticky notes, uh, we can design together, and that sense of collaborating in real time makes us so much more efficient. Um, more efficient than we were before, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Because you, you're not getting distracted with each other when you're in the same room. Exactly, exactly. And we're all focused. Uh, you know, our time is, uh, if, if the meeting's an hour, we spend that exact hour before we mm -hmm. go on to other things, which keeps us on task, on target. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Any other changes apart from the that technology change? No, nah, not, not really. I mean, functionally, we, we talk every morning. I have a, a virtual stand-up call every morning, which I didn't have before, just to mm. check in, you know, safety, uh, health-wise. Um, and then uh, I always start with what problems, what blocks are you having currently? Um, let's, let's, let's attack those first. Uh, and then let's get on to the fun stuff. Let's get on to designing and helping the sales folks win some business. The fun stuff, exactly. Um, Targets and objectives, did they change either way over the, the last six months? No, they're all the same. Uh, we, we have a very, uh, I would call it intimate um, process for designing our 12 and 24-month targets. And mm. they become our marching orders when we talk uh, on a weekly basis about what have we done to push that forward. You know, that those targets come up. Our strategic plan is at the forefront of us making, you know, our revenue targets, making our project targets, just completing the day-to-day -day tasks all have to roll up to our strategic plan. Over the past few weeks, we've spoken to a hundred sales leaders around the world to understand the impact of COVID-19 on revenue. And we've combined these insights into one single report that covers the immediate impact, the commercial outlook, the tech stack that you need, and actionable advice for sales leaders. 
You can claim this whole report completely for free if you go to ebster.com forward slash COVID. That's ebster.com forward slash COVID. Got it. Now let's talk about that strategic plan. Um, what was the process for, and specifically looking at the sales forecast, what was the process for creating that and what was your role? It, it's a long, I mean, it's a long process. Uh, our strategic planning starts in, in, actually, we've already started this year. We're starting a little bit early, but it usually starts in October and it goes all the way through January. Um, it starts, for, particularly for me, it's the forecasting piece. And uh, well, me and one of the business analysts on my team, we really dig in to uh, not just our ability to reach a, a a goal, but what does our performance over the last 24 months tell us about our ability to reach that goal in the future? What opportunities are there? Um, and then we bring in marketing and look at um, where are the gaps in the market where we can address an attack so that uh, we can make better, higher, more higher value sales. Um, and we take all of that and we create sort of like a plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D kind of thing. And, and that allows us to pick and choose whether or not we need to hire more people or we need to change our, our uh, project scheduling to, uh, to make sure that we can to hit our revenue targets knowing that some of the projects that we do go for 50 to 60 to 70 weeks for the build time. So we have to take that into consideration. So we're, we're bringing in just about every part of our organization in, in that planning process. But my main part is let's figure out, you know, what the available revenue can be versus what target does the company needs to be at to be profitable and successful. Make, makes total sense. And so this forecasting process is kicking off now for next calendar year. That's Next correct. financial year. Correct. Okay, makes sense. Awesome. Where do you think that your forecasting process, if at all, can improve? Or where do you think that uh, an area that may not be that accurate? You know, I, I've done this in four different companies and... I've always had a finance partner. I have a finance partner now that helps me with with forecasting. And the the forecast is only as good as the previous data, correct? Uh, if 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 one of the sales folks they say, "Hey, I can close this deal in six months," and it takes nine months, and we're off uh, by three months, you know that data gets recorded. Um, that sale gets recorded, uh, and then we try, you know, do the post mortem to figure out. Why? What could we have done to speed up that sale to be more on time? Uh, and I think that's the that's the crux. That's the problem that we all tend to to just not have a really good solution. Uh, what I've done is I've basically given our forecasting bands. So I, I give our forecasting a red, yellow, green band. Uh, so I do a 90%, a 60%, a 50% uh, accuracy rating on our forecast. And that in the end, that's what we produce. And when I produce the updates every month for that forecast to revenue, uh, I show the red, the green, and the yellow uh, in terms of a heat map to the executive so that they have some understanding of what that confidence interval is. Awesome. And that makes total sense. What could happen to a deal? Like, what is the reason a deal would be a 50% forecast accuracy versus 90%? If that's the opinion of the sales rep. Yeah. So for us, it's, uh, I'll give you a perfect example. For us, uh, we get a project. We know that a company is funding this project, but because of COVID, funding has gone to different areas of that company. This project is on their books. It, it has been a funded project, but we don't know when that those dollars will return uh, to refund that project. Uh, when, when you're dealing with capital projects, money can come and go uh, as quickly as, as someone has a different set of, uh, of financial rules or priorities have changed at a leadership level. So uh, that, that is, a, in essence, what we do, we're specifically dealing with right now. Awesome. And so 
if you get informed by the client that there has been a change in priority for that capital, then the accuracy of the forecast of revenue would go down maybe to 50% or whatever. Okay, Absolutely. Sense. Yeah. Amazing. Let, let's talk about KPIs. And I, I want to stretch back throughout your whole career in sales ops. What has been a KPI that you have, that you always look forward to looking at or that gives you the most value as a sales ops leader? Yeah, great question. The KPI that I mostly look at is uh, time, the, the the time to close. So from opportunity creation to the actual close date. Um, and I look at it in two ways. I look at the actual, you know, the duration, the days it takes for a deal to close. But I also look at the amount of times that opportunity has changed from I would say a positive outcome into a no outcome. Uh, I think we, for me, I really want to understand uh, if a project is going to take, uh, let's say, 180 days to close. I want to know what the process that the salesperson has gone through to make them wax and wane on whether they thought this was going to close. If I can improve that, I can then improve the days that it takes to close. So if I can get to the root cause of why it was going to close, not going to close, is going to close, not going to close, is going to close, not going to close. If I can get to that, I can take that 180 days and make it into 120 days using intelligence and analytics and, and better support, uh, earlier support. So those are the two things that I really, really dig into when it comes to analyzing closed deals. That makes total sense. I, and I've never heard, I've heard time to close before, but I've never heard this kind of going into more detail to understand if the, it has, uh, maybe it's a better word, but flip-flopped between thinking it'll close to it won't. And that's a super interesting detail that I think any sales ops person should be aware of on, on the big deals anyway. So that makes total sense. Um, and has that metric retained, I assume, yes, but has that metric retained its value throughout the last six months? Like that hasn't got any more or less valuable? It actually got has gotten more valuable. Uh, it really has, you know, an understanding that, you know, during COVID and in people, you know, companies not doing manufacturing, people, you know, being sent off the manufacturing floor, uh, companies are now trying to automate more heavily in understanding the ebb and flow of capital projects and understanding where those priorities are, we can then position ourselves to get in front of that. And sales ops can support that 100% by making sure that we have all the right tools and all the right people in place to take advantage of those gaps. And again, so understanding why a customer would say no versus yes on any given day reduces the time that we can go from a an opportunity created to an actual closed opportunity by cutting out the back and forth. Nice. Makes sense. Now, moving on, what, who um, within your career of, in the sales office part has been the most uh, inspirational or who has taught you the most? The person I give it give the most credit to my learning and my 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 growth in sales ops is uh my old vp of sales and operations uh his name uh <laughs> i'm gonna say josh but he he goes by joshua joshua templeton um he he actually really pushed me very 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 hard to look past what is classically sales ops um he had an understanding of how he wanted the business to run and he is a vision guy. He isn't a details guy and he hired me to be the details guy. But because of that, he really pushed me on every detail and he wanted his vision to be perfect. And when it wasn't, uh, he pushed me even harder. And I think that, that push, that, that, urgency to get it done right has really uh, expanded my career and 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 allows me to think outside the box and where regular sales off folks wouldn't wouldn't go wouldn't go to think like i would amazing shout out to josh and finally who else in the sales ops world would you like to take for lunch whether you know them or not that's a great question uh wow i would like to take a lot of different ceos to lunch um Jeez, 
I couldn't think of a sales ops person I would like to take the lunch uh, at, at the moment, but I would definitely, there, there are a few CEOs from some companies that I really admire that, that I would take to lunch in a heartbeat. For example, can you share one? Yeah. yeah so, uh, yeah, I, w- I would take uh, the CEO of SBI. Um, you know, he he's one of those guys that that as a consultant, he sees not just marketing and sales and sales ops, but he sees the the go between where companies are failing and where companies are winning and trying to organize sales to be the most efficient. And he's got some really crazy ideas. And those are the kind of people that you really want to, at least for me, but I really want to get get in front of to understand what's going through your brilliant mind over there to, to come up with these crazy, crazy ideas that are actually working. And I, and I want to take some of that and I want to use it in my own repertoire. Amazing. And that, so that would be an ideal lunch. You'd just be sucking all the, the knowledge. I would just um, be sucking all the knowledge. I know that's not, not a fair trade, but uh, yeah, I can be no, a little no, selfish. That's, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, amazing. Rupa, thank you. That was a really kind of interesting insight into actually quite a different uh, sales process than we normally have. It seems like much less transactional, more technical. And I really like the, the the second part of your metric. And I think that's the thing I would urge any sales ops person listening to this to take away is obviously me looking at the deals in the pipeline, but also looking at the detail. And I assume you can see this somewhere in Salesforce. But how many times has the the status flipped between maybe not closing to definitely closing and then digging into that and understanding and then being able to add value. So Rupert, thank you so much uh, for coming on. It was a pleasure. Have me anytime.